May the world become peaceful. May all men and women be gentle and honest. May all think of mutual welfare. May the minds of all be turned to the highest good. May there be devotion in the hearts of all to the Supreme Lord. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. It was a quiet morning at 3 a.m. in the spring of 1885. Goramani Devi, a simple, fervently devoted village woman, began practicing her morning japa, repetition of her mantra, in a small room at the Kamarhati Temple Garden on the bank of the Ganges. As she was about to offer the results of japa to her chosen deity, a startling thing happened. She saw that Ramakrishna himself was seated immediately to her left. She was amazed at how he could have silently come to her room at that hour. Seeing his sweet smile, though, she took courage and grasped his left hand. As soon as she did, his form disappeared, and in its place was Gopala, the boy Krishna, as a child of 10 months, crawling toward her and asking her for butter. She protested that she was but a poor, helpless widow who had no butter or cream to give him. But Gopala did not listen and repeatedly asked her for something to eat. Tearfully, she retrieved some dry coconut balls from a hanging basket and placed them in his hand, apologizing for the wretched offering. She later related, I could not perform japa at all that day Gopala sat on my shoulders, snatched away my rosary, jumped on my lap, and moved around the room. At daybreak, I rushed to Doc Shinaswar like a crazy woman. Gopala also accompanied me, resting his head on my shoulder. I distinctly saw Gopala's two tiny rosy feet hanging over my bosom. What is a rational person to think about an account like this. Is this really an account of seeing God with eyes open, or is it craziness? For the next hour, we're going to look into the life of Agaramani Devi, one of the inspiring women devotees of Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, which we rarely hear about. We'll look at the stunning realizations of her spiritual life, the practices that brought them about, and how her shining example might help all of us to see God more clearly. In the incident we just heard, an apparent apparition of Ramakrishna transforms himself into a baby Krishna who proceeds to talk to and pester his hostess until she is forced to rush to Dakshineswar in great distress to seek relief from the flesh and blood Ramakrishna. Was this hallucinations, dementia, psychosis. There's an old joke. When you talk to God, we call it prayer. But when God talks to you, we call it schizophrenia. <laughs> I can honestly say that Jesus Christ once talked to me in person, though I must qualify that it was during a nursing rotation at the state mental hospital on <laughs> Arsenal. There certainly is a known relationship between religion and schizophrenia, as both religious experiences and psychotic episodes frequently display auditory and or visual hallucinations. But hearing a voice when by yourself or seeing something no one else can is a surprisingly common occurrence. An anthropologist who studies such things says that at least one person in 10, if you ask them directly, will say they've had the experience of hearing a voice or seeing something not heard by others. In 1999, a Gallup poll said that 23% of Americans heard a voice or have seen a vision in response to prayer. 
However, schizophrenia, is as bad as it is, is rather rare. Only one person in 100 is so diagnosed. There are many cases when it is hard to doubt that God or deities do indeed talk to human beings. Consider God talking to Abraham, Moses, and Job in the Bible. St. Teresa of Avila also had messages directly from God. Swami Brahmananda had a conversation with Jesus Christ at Christmas. And the child visionaries of Medjugorje saw and heard regular apparitions of the Virgin Mary, some of them to this very day. So for some reputable people who say they hear directly from God, it is too facile to be immediately doubtful or to say it's, direct, it's due to mental illness, particularly when there is extreme devotion involved, as is the case in those mentioned. For our purposes, we can let a young Vivekananda settle the matter of Agoramani Devi's veracity. In his early years, as a member of the Brahma Samaj, Narendra, as he was then known, believed only in a formless God without attributes. He was very learned, rational, and had a striking aversion for deities and images. On the other hand, Agoramani Devi was poor, uneducated, but dedicated to chanting God's name. One day, when they both were at Dakshineswar, Ramakrishna, with his characteristic sense of humor, asked Agoramani Devi to describe her visions of Gopala to Narendra. Most likely, it was another part of Ramakrishna's mission to soften Vivekananda's then very dogmatic views about devotion and a personal God. So as Ramakrishna had told Agoramani not to tell the visions to others it was, as it would hinder them in the future, she asked him if it was all right to tell Narendra. Quote, after being reassured, reassured by the master, meaning Ramakrishna, that it would be all right, she began to describe in a voice choked with tears how she had first seen Gopala. She then narrated in detail the divine play of Gopala over the next two months, how she had carried Gopala in her arms from Kamarhati to Dakshineswar, placing his head on her shoulder, how she had clearly seen his two red feet dangling over her chest, how Gopala had entered and come out of the master's body from time to time, how Gopala had complained when he did not get a pillow to sleep on, how Gopala collected firewood for cooking and behaved mischievously, mischievously to get food. As she described these events, she became overwhelmed with devotion and again began to see God in the form of Gopala. Although Narendra had a strong rationalistic veneer, his heart was filled with love and devotion underneath. He could not control his tears when he was faced with Gopal Ma's ecstatic state and heard about her visions. Gopal Ma is how Agaramani Devi is known later. The elderly lady now and then interrupted her story to say, my son, you are learned and intelligent and I'm a poor illiterate widow. I don't understand anything. Please tell me, are these visions true? Narendra repeatedly assured her, yes, mother, what you have seen is all true. So we will take Narendra's confirmation that these were true visions of God as Gopala, and that though they are far out of the realm of our own ordinary experience, there was nothing pathological about them. Before we talk about Goramani Devi's life prior to seeing Gopala, we need to talk a bit about attitude. This is not the kind where we say, yeah, he's got attitude, meaning somebody with a take no prisoners kind of personality. This is spiritual attitude. In traditional Hinduism, there are five dualistic attitudes which are recognized as paths to approach God. This is uh, in the realm of bhakti yoga, or devotional love. So these attitudes are called bhavas, and they characterize moods uh, or attitudes of the devotee's personal relationship with God. They're meant to help seekers of God intensify a personal relationship with God as a path to God realization. 
Ramakrishna himself spoke emphatically about the need to establish such a relationship. Quote, whatever form of God or spiritual mood you like, hold on to that firmly. Only then will you get steadfast devotion. God can be reached through devotion. Can anyone attain him without that? One needs bhava. One should adopt a particular attitude and call on him. As is a person's meditation, so is his feeling of love. As is a person's feeling of love, so is his gain, and faith is the root of all. One should cultivate a spiritual attitude and faith and hold on to him firmly. Only then can one succeed. Do you know what bhava means? It is to establish a relationship with God and then to remember it all the time. For example, I am a servant of God, I am a child of God, I am a part of God. This is the ripe ego, the ego of knowledge. Always remember this, even while you are eating, sitting, and resting." End quote. While there are many other bhavas, the five that are predominantly mentioned well, we'll go over. Shantabhava is a calm and peaceful attitude characterized by quiet love and joy. Seeing God in everything and every being, we become calm and joyful. This comes from the deep faith and assurance that God loves us completely and unconditionally. God meets all our needs and answers our prayers like an all loving parent. This sense of deep trust and faith in God provides a stable foundation for pursuing any of the other bhavas. Dasya bhava is the attitude of a servant towards the master. In it, one's personal will is abandoned before the will of God in loving service. This service becomes one's chief vocation or mission in life, the central guiding purpose which makes our life meaningful. This may take the form of altruistic or religious service performed as service to God. Hanuman is the exemplar of this attitude in his faithful service to Rama. Sakyabhava is the attitude of a friend toward God, much like the sense of two kids who enjoy playing games together. Unlike Dashyabhava, which is more serious and goal-oriented, Sakya is lighter, freer, with little of the effort obvious in Dasya. There is an emphasis on God's playful and mischievous qualities rather than power and majesty. In this bhava, there's a real sense of intimacy with God that is not apparent in Shanta or Dasya bhava. Examples of Sakya bhava are the male childhood friends of Krishna, which are known as gualbals, which was a new word to me, and most of the time, Arjuna in his relationship with the adult Krishna. Vatsalya bhava is the attitude of a parent towards a child. It is this attitude which Agoramani Devi practiced so successfully, she feeling that she was the mother of the child Krishna, Gopala. For us in the West, this is a pretty foreign concept. We're used to thinking about God as parent, father, mother, or even temporarily about a mother-child relationship in the case of the baby Jesus. But Imagining ourselves as a parent of God who is typically viewed as omniscient and omnipresent, it's almost inconceivable for us. Just try to think of God as dependent, weak, and even helpless. It's pretty difficult. Yet there's a great deal to recommend this particular attitude. We must remember that bhakti isn't about metaphysics. It's about emotional intensity. And what emotion is more powerful than a parent's, particularly a mother's, love for their child? If you are a parent or have watched others with infants or toddlers, you know how terribly demanding they can be. But equally amazing is the way many parents seem to be able to tap a bottomless well of devotion in order to meet these endless demands. A notable characteristic of this attitude is its selflessness. There is no thought of reward or merit whether in this life or hereafter. The only reward for a devoted parent 
is to enjoy the child's presence and know that they are safe and happy. In a similar sense, the devotee who practiced Vatsalya Bhava knows that the whole purpose of loving God in this way is simply to enjoy God's presence and inherent perfection. Madhura Bhava, the fifth and final one, is the attitude of a lover towards the beloved. Chaitanya demonstrated the validity of this path in his ecstatic relationship with God as Krishna. Ramakrishna also practiced this attitude for six months, where his agony over the separation from Krishna made him forget about eating or sleeping. He also warned that this attitude could only be practiced by one of extreme renunciation, who had completely given up the body idea. So these are the traditional five bhavas. They're often presented in hierarchical fashion, implying an increasing order of intensity, as well as an implication that one might have practiced and graduated from shanta, peaceful, dasya, servant, sakya, friendly bhavas, before practicing vatsalya, parent-child. But because each bhava can be practiced to a depth commensurate with the ardor of the devotee, this doesn't mean that the early bhavas are any less profound than the later ones. And devotees may simply find the bhava that suits them best and just stay there without practicing any others. Today, we'll be exploring Agoramani Devi's highly successful practice of Vatsalya bhava, which produced such amazing interactions with God as Gopala. Let's begin with some background on her life. She was born of a Brahmin family in Kamarhati, a northern suburb of Calcutta, around 1822. According to the custom of the time, she was married at the age of nine. But her wedding was the only time she ever saw her husband, for he died before they ever lived together. This left her a widow at the age of 14. Her family's uh, guru, though, initiated her and with the child Krishna as her chosen deity, she was given a Gopala mantra. As a Brahmin widow, she was unable to remarry, so she lived with her parents until they passed away. Kamarhati was the site of a large temple garden on the bank of the Ganges, which had been established by one Govinda Datta. Datta had become very wealthy as agent for a well-known European firm in Calcutta, and this prosperity allowed him to spend time on religious activities and spiritual discourses. The temple celebrated festivals year-round for worship of the Radha and Krishna deities which had been installed there. They would take the prasad from the worships and freely distribute those to visitors and the poor. Dada's wife, Mana Mohini, was also a very devoted person, and after his death, she continued in this grand way for some time. But later, in order to maintain the worship amidst reduced resources, she supervised all activities herself, living like a nun in the temple garden, sleeping on the floor, bathing three times a day, and eating one meal a day. Agoramani Devi had a close connection with this temple garden, as her brother, Nelmada Banjipadhyay, was priest for the Dada family and the Radhakrishna temple. She spent much of her time there, serving the deities and the temple worship. As her devotion intensified, she had a strong desire to live in the temple garden, which she mentioned to Mana Mohini. Agoramani and Mana Mohini had many things in common, including a passion for austerities and brahmacharya and strong devotion to the temple deities. So it was arranged that Agoramani would live in a room in the women's quarters, though she continued to visit her family daily. From three southern windows in her room, she could see the Ganges. She had few material desires, so she sold her husband's property and her own jewelry, receiving six or seven hundred rupees, which had been invested in securities with her landlady's help. She then used the interest from this investment to maintain herself, with assistance from Mana Mohini when necessary. With no husband, no children, and few economic concerns, this left Goramani Devi free to devote herself to service at the temple and her own arduous spiritual practices. Sensitive from the time she was a child, she couldn't bear criticism 
and was strongly independent, never dreaming of asking anyone for financial help. She was also extreme in her religious practices, had very strict standards, and did not hesitate to tell others about their improprieties. Sound like anybody you know? As a result, people found her hard to get along with. So living in a solitary room in the southern part of the temple garden suited her perfectly. Sister Nivedita, in her elegant and poetic prose, described a visit to this little room of Agora Manis. Quote, in the months which I spent with the Holy Mother and her ladies, Gopalarma would sometimes be in Calcutta, and sometimes, for weeks together, away at Kamrahati. There, a few of us went, one full moon night, to visit her. How beautiful was the Ganges as the little boat crept on and on, and how beautiful seemed the long flight of steps rising out of the water and leading up through its lofty bathing ghat, past the terrace lawn, to the cloister-like veranda on the right, where, in a little room, probably built in the first place for some servant of the great house at its side, Gopalar Ma had lived and told her beads for many a year. The great house was empty now, and her own little room was absolutely without comforts. Her bed was of stone and her floor of stone, and the piece of matting she offered her guests to sit on had to be taken down from a shelf and unrolled. The handful of parched rice and sugar candy that formed her only store and were all that she could give in hospitality were taken from an earthen pot that hung from the roof by a few cords. But this place was spotlessly clean, washed constantly by Ganges water of her own sturdy carrying. In a niche near her lay an old copy of the Ramayana and her great horn spectacles and the little white bag containing her beads. On those beads, Gopalar Ma had become a saint. Hour after hour, day after day, for how many years had she sat, day and night, absorbed in them?" End quote. Agoramani's daily routine, with its lengthy spiritual practices, would have been impressive even for a monastic. She arose at 2 a.m. and washed before the starting japa, which continued until 8 a.m. Following this, she gave service at the temple by cleaning, washing worship vessels, picking flowers, and making sandal paste and garlands. She bathed twice a day, in the morning in the Ganges and in the evening in the pond. After the morning bath, she meditated in the temple garden. Then she gathered fuel to cook her meal, which might consist of rice, dal, bitter squash, and potatoes. Anything cooked would be first offered by placing it on a banana leaf plate in front of a wooden seat reserved for Gopala. After eating this prasad, she might rest a while before starting japa again. In the evening, she attended the temple vesper service, then ate a simple supper of a few dry coconut balls which had been offered and a little milk. She would resume japa until her bedtime around midnight. Agoramani passed over 30 years in this fashion at the temple garden before she met Sri Ramakrishna. By even a conservative estimate, if we add up the hours in her daily routine, she may have practiced japa more than 12 hours a day. Think of it. Without knowing how long her mantra was, it was difficult to estimate how many repetitions this was but it certainly was a very large number. If we take a standard common Krishna mantra, Om Krishnaya Namaha, and repeat it for 12 hours, I calculated that it would total at least 25,000 repetitions. A monk once asked Holy Mother how many times he should repeat his mantra so he could have good concentration. Her answer was that he could repeat it 10,000 or even 20,000 times, or as many times as he could. At another time, she told Swami Dirananda that the mind would be steadied if one repeats the name of God 15 or 20,000 times a day. She added that japa needs to be practiced with some devotion and that she herself had experienced the result. 
So we know from no less an authority than Holy Mother that Agoramani Devi's practice of 12 hours or more of japa a day was bound to have a very significant effect. Although Agoramani Devi wasn't known as Gopalma or Gopala's mother until the instant we began with, she had seen Gopala before she met Ramakrishna. Swami Ramakrishnananda described this incident. Quote, one day she was cooking as usual, but the fire would not burn. The wood was heavy with moisture, and there was an adverse wind which blew the smoke into her eyes. Finally, when the bit of rice and curry was done, and she was about to pour it on the leaf, the same adverse wind blew away the leaf. Then she began to scold God for making everything so bad for Gopala. As she was talking, a little boy brought the, back the leaf, held it flat on the ground until she had put the food on it, and then disappeared. She began to feed her Gopala, but suddenly she began to ask herself, who was that little boy? And she realized that it was Gopala himself. From that moment on, she became mad. All day and night, she kept crying, where is my Gopala? Where is my Gopala? She could not sleep or eat. Only at night would she prepare a little food for Gopala, and everyone thought that she had really become mad. Goramani Devi first went to Dakshuneswar in the fall of 1884 with Manamohini and a woman, woman relative of hers. They came by boat as both their temple garden and Dakshuneswar's were on the banks of the Ganges. They had heard about the wonderful holy man of Dakshuneswar and had come to seek an audience with him. Ramakrishna, on his part, was glad to receive them and talked about devotion to God and sang some devotional songs. As they were leaving, he asked them to come again. In response, Manamohini invited him to visit their temple garden in Kamrahati, which Ramakrishna said he would do when it was convenient for him. Ramakrishna later spoke highly of them both. Ah, what beautiful expressions on their faces. They're floating in the ocean of bliss and devotion. Their eyes are soaked with divine love. Even the tilak on their noses is beautiful. Without knowing why, Agoramani found herself highly drawn to the master, Ramakrishna. She couldn't explain this fascination, but thought, he is a wonderful holy man and a true devotee. As soon as I have time, I shall come back to see him. It is believed that Mana Mohini felt the same way, but there is no indication that she ever returned to Dakshineswar. A few days later, when Agaramani was practicing japa, she had a strong desire to visit Ramakrishna again. <coughs> Following the Indian custom of never visiting a holy person empty-handed, she bought two or three pice worth of stale sandish to take with her. Swami Sardananda completes this story. Quote, when the master saw her, he exclaimed, Oh, you've come. Please give me what you brought for me. Gopal Ma later said, I was terribly embarrassed. How could I give him that stale sandish? So many people brought so many fancy dishes to feed him. But as soon as I arrived, he asked for that bad sandish. She was speechless with fear and shame, but she reluctantly handed those stale sweets to him. The master immediately started to eat them with great relish and said to her, why do you spend money on sweets? Prepare some sweet coconut balls, and when you visit this place, bring one or two of them with you. Or you may bring a little of the ordinary dishes that you cook yourself, a hodgepodge curry with pumpkin leaves or a preparation with potatoes, eggplants, drumsticks, which are a kind of vegetable, and little balls of mashed legumes. I want to eat your cooking. Gopal Ma later related, there was no talk about God or religion. He went on speaking about this dish and that. I thought, what a strange monk I've come to see. He only talks about food. I'm a poor widow. Where shall I get so many delicacies for him? Enough, I won't come back again. But as soon as I passed through the gates of Dakshineswar Garden, I felt as if he were pulling me back. I couldn't proceed further. I had a hard time persuading my mind to leave, but at last I returned to Kamarhati. 
A few days later, the Goramani again walked the three miles to see Sri Ramakrishna, this time carrying a hodgepodge curry for him. As soon as she arrived, the master demanded food as before, and after relishing it said, what a delicacy, it is like nectar. Tears rolled down Agoramani's cheeks as she saw the master's joy. She thought that the master had appreciated her humble offering only because she was poor. Over the next three or four months, Agoramani visited Dakshinishwar often. Whenever she cooked a dish that she particularly liked, she would take it to the master on the next visit. The master relished that immensely and would ask her to bring more dishes, such as a soup of watercress or a curry with calmy spinach. As she listened to the master's request, bring this dish or that, she sometimes thought in disgust, oh Gopala, is this how you have answered my prayers? You brought me to a holy man who only asked for food. I shall not come again. But as soon as she returned to Kamarhati, she would feel that irresistible pull and could think only of how soon she could visit the master again. Of course, what was happening here was the gradual intensification of the relationship between Ramakrishna and Agoramani, in the same way that we must gradually build a personal relationship with our chosen ideal. By being so highly pleased by whatever food Agoramani brought him, Ramakrishna was ensuring that she would think well of him and keep coming back. You may remember the story that Ramakrishna told M on his second visit about the peacock who had become habituated to a daily pill of opium and returned at the same time every day, essentially inferring that M's return to Dr. Shiniswar to see Ramakrishna was like that habituation. For both M and Agoramani, it was Ramakrishna's intoxicating spiritual power that kept drawing them back like a magnet, creating a spiritual relationship of such depth and urgency that they could not stay away for long. This building of the relationship between Agoramani Devi and Ramakrishna continued during the winter of 1884. So it was on a spring morning in 1885 that the incident we began with took place where the form of Ramakrishna became the real Gopala, described as a large child who entreated his devoted mother for food and otherwise behaved like the naughty boy we've heard Krishna was in legend. As you recall, this was too much for Goramani Devi, and she said that at daybreak, she rushed to Dakshineshwar like a crazy woman. A known woman devotee who was present at the time described what she saw. Quote, it was seven or half past seven in the morning. I was cleaning the master's room when I heard a familiar voice calling, Gopala, Gopala. I looked outside and saw Gopal Ma coming towards the master's room. She entered through the eastern door like one intoxicated, her hair disheveled, her eyes staring, and the end of her cloth trailing on the ground. She was completely oblivious to her surroundings. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on his small cot. I was dumbfounded when I saw Gopal Ma in that condition. The master immediately entered into an ecstatic mood. Gopal Ma sat beside him, and he sat on her lap like a child. Tears were flowing profusely from her eyes. She fed the master with cream, butter, and sweets that she had brought with her. I was astounded for never before had, had I seen the master touch a woman while he was in a state of ecstasy, although I had heard that the master once sat on the lap of Bhairavi Brahmani, his guru, when he was in the mood of Gopala and she was in the mood of Yashoda, Krishna's foster mother. However, I was stupefied witnessing Gopal Ma's condition and the master's ecstasy. After some time, the master regained his normal consciousness and went back to his cot. But Gopalma could, could not control her exuberant emotion. In rapture, she began dancing around the room, repeating, Brahma is dancing and Vishnu is dancing. As he watched her ecstasy, the master told me with a smile, look, she is engulfed in bliss. Her mind is now in the abode of Gopala. 
Gopal Ma did indeed have such visions while in ecstasy, and she became a different person because of them. On another occasion, while Gopal Ma was eating her meal, she became overwhelmed by ecstasy and fed all of us by hand, considering us to be her Gopala. She disliked me a little because I had not married my daughter into a family of equal rank, but on that day she humbly apologized, saying, Did I know that you have so much faith and devotion? Gopala, meaning Ramakrishna, can touch almost no one when he is in ecstasy, but today he sat on your shoulders while in Bhava Samadhi. You are not an ordinary person. End quote. There's much information in this first person account of the woman devotee. When Agoramani Devi called out to Gopala as she approached the master's room, she was calling for Ramakrishna himself, whom she considered verily to be her Gopala. For it had been the form of Ramakrishna that had transformed before her eyes into that of her Gopala. And her description of herself as a crazy woman at that time was highly accurate and also highly unusual. The disheveled appearance and mindless behavior were not at all like a Goramani Devi that everyone knew. There is a saying in India that child widows are so fastidious that they even wash their salt before using it. A Goramani was like this, both as she grew up and in later years. Sardananda wrote that she was, quote, extreme in her religious customs and practices. For example, one day while she was serving rice from a pot onto Sri Ramakrishna's plate, the master's hand somehow touched the wooden spoon she was using. Agoramani could not eat the rice left in the pot, and she even threw that wooden spoon into the Ganges." End quote. There were two or three clay ovens in the Nahabat where Holy Mother lived at Dakshineswar. She used all of them to cook both for the master and also for any devotees who came to visit either just for the day or overnight. But on those days when Agoramani came to see Ramakrishna, Holy Mother would cook for him first, then purify one of the ovens with three layers of cow dung and Ganges water so Agoramani could start her own cooking. It's an interesting way of purification from our <laughs> Western standpoint. Agoramani was exceptionally strict in how she followed the rules and customs she had grown up with. So both her behavior and appearance on this particular morning were very much out of character for her. She said many things to Ramakrishna on this day. Here is Gopala in my arms. Now he enters into you, pointing to Ramakrishna. There, he comes out again. Come, my child, come to your wretched mother. While talking in this manner, she saw the naughty Gopala vanish into the master's body and re reappear before her in the form of a luminous boy. His extraordinary play and childish pranks overwhelmed her, making her forget the strict rules, rites, and routines of the external world. As Sardananda writes, who could control oneself after being caught by that mighty spiritual tidal wave? Because of her absorption in Gopala, the boy Krishna, Agoramani Devi was known after this incident as Gopal Ma, or Gopalar Ma in some variation, meaning Gopala's mother. Sister Nivedita wrote an interesting comment on what she considers our inability to successfully translate the word Gopala. The word has always been given the literal meaning associated with Krishna, which is cow herd. But Nivedita asserts that its real significance can only be rendered in English as Christ child. Therefore, the only parallel for a woman who considers Gopala her son is that in English of one who thinks of her child as the Christ child. In this way, Nivedita considered Gopal Ma to be the Christ child's mother. On this day that Goramani Devi became Gopal Ma, Ramakrishna showed great delight in her wonderful ecstasy. But he also tried to calm her by stroking her body and feeding her delicacies. While still eating, she said, Gopala, my darling, your wretched mother has led a life of dire poverty. She has to make her living by spinning and selling sacred thread. 
Is that why you are taking special care of her today? And the master indeed kept her at Dakshineswar the remainder of that day so he could keep an eye on her. She had her bath and her meals there. And when he was assured she could manage, Ramakrishna sent her back to Kamrahadi in the evening. And the child, Gopala, went with her, resting in her arms. When she arrived in her room, she started to perform japa as she was accustomed to at that hour of the day. But she found it impossible as Gopala demanded this and that and kept pestering her as he played before her. Even when she went to bed, Gopala complained and she only had a hard bed with no pillow. She had to cradle his head on her arm and promised him that in the morning she would ask Mana Mohini's daughter to make him a pillow, removing the seeds from the cotton. In the morning, when she went to gather firewood wood for cooking, Gopala was right near her, also collecting wood and stacking it in the kitchen. When the cooking began, he either sat beside her or rode around on her back, watching her work. As before, he went on talking and making demands, which she tried to control with sweet words, or sometimes even scolding. A few days later, she returned to Dakshineswar to see the master. After greeting him, she went to the Nahabat, where she sat to practice japa. The master came there from the Panchavati and asked her, why do you practice so much japa? You have plenty of visions. Gopal Ma asked, shall I not practice japa anymore? Have I attained everything? The master responded, yes, you have attained everything. Everything, asked Gopal Ma. Yes, everything, said the master. What are you saying, asked Gopal Ma. Have I accomplished everything? The master said, yes, you have. It is no longer necessary for you to practice japa and austerity for yourself. But you may continue these disciplines for the welfare of this body, pointing to himself. Gopal Ma agreed, all right. Whatever I do henceforth will be for you, you, you. It took three reassurances from Ramakrishna, but Gopal Ma finally accepted the fact that there was nothing left for her to achieve spiritually and that any spiritual practices she continued would be solely for the benefit of the master. Gopal Ma referred to this instant later telling us, when I heard those words from Gopala, meaning Ramakrishna, I threw my rosary in its little bag into the Ganges that day. I decided to repeat Japa on my fingers for his welfare. Long after, I procured another rosary. At that time, I thought, I must do something. How can I pass 24 hours without doing anything? So I tell my beads for his welfare. From that point on, Gopal Ma's japa and austerities for herself came to an end. But her visits to the master in Dakshineswar became more frequent. Her previously strict observance of rules concerning food, cleanliness, and routine began to dissipate gradually in that great spiritual current. Gopala now occupied her heart and mind completely. There was no limit to the things that he taught her. How could she maintain her orthodox habits now? Gopala demanded food now and then, and sometimes he put part of his food into her mouth as he ate. How could she refuse it? When she did so, Gopala wept. Buffeted by that spiritual tidal wave, Gopala Ma realized that it was all Sri Ramakrishna's play and that it was he who is her Krishna in the form of Gopala, quote, dark like a rain cloud, with eyes like the petals of a blue lotus close. So she cooked for him, fed him, and no longer hesitated to eat his prasad. These visions and daily mothering of Gopala went on continuously for two months. During this time, Gopal Ma was in a constant ecstatic mood and found it hard to maintain her daily routine with the added responsibility of attending to her beloved Gopala. Only through sheer force of habit was she able to keep her routine. Quote, Sri Ramakrishna told Gopal Ma, 
you've achieved enough spiritual experiences. In this Kali Yuga, if one has such visions continuously, one's body cannot last long. Perhaps it was the master's will that the pure body of this poor woman should be spared some years more for the good of humanity as a glowing example of motherly love for God. After two months, Gopal Ma's visions and experiences subsided to a great degree. However, she was able to regain the vision as before <clears throat> when she sat quietly and meditated on Gopala. But we shouldn't think that Gopal Ma now had a shortage of visions of Gopala. In fact, after the two months, <clears throat> he still appeared to her several times a day. Whenever she was anxious to see Gopala, she saw him. If she needed to learn anything, Gopala suddenly appeared before her, teaching her through a sign or words or demonstration and inducing her to do as he did. By merging himself into the master again and again, Gopala convinced Gopal Ma that he and Ramakrishna were one. Gopala taught her how to serve him by asking her for special foods to eat and things to lie upon. By showing Gopal Ma how he associated with some special devotees of Sri Ramakrishna and how he behaved with them, Gopala showed his mother that there was no difference between them and himself. The devotees and God were one. Thus, her unwillingness to eat food that devotees had gradually touched gradually disappeared. Ramakrishna received many devotees at Dakshineswar. And according to the custom which we mentioned not to visit holy people empty-handed, everyone brought gifts of some kind, often nuts, fruits, beetle leaves, or rock candy. Ramakrishna couldn't consume gifts from members of the business community, however, because he said they always had desires attached to them. He humorously said, if they offer one beetle roll, they connect it with 16 desires. May I win the lawsuit, may I be cured from disease, may I make a profit in my business, and so on. Consequently, he couldn't eat their gifts and wouldn't allow his devotees either because they would contaminate the mind of the person eating it. The only devotees that Ramakrishna would give these gifts to were Vivekananda and Gopal Ma, because he knew their minds were such high realms that they could never be contaminated. This in itself tells us how exalted Gopal Ma's spiritual state had become as a result of her intense practices that all of Ramakrishna's disciples, for this purpose, she alone would be put in the same category as the great Vivekananda. Although Ramakrishna assured Gopal Ma that she had achieved everything spiritually, this did not mean that she was beyond his instruction, for he was a strict disciplinarian, even with free souls. The following occurred while the master was staying at Balaram Bosha's house. He raved so much about Gopal Ma's visions, faith, and devotion that Balaram sent someone to bring her to his home. After a joyful two days at Balaram's, it was arranged that Gopal Ma and Golap Ma, another close woman devotee, would accompany Ramakrishna back to Dakshineswar. As they were on the boat getting ready to leave, members of Balaram's family presented to Gopal Ma with some clothes a ladle, cooking utensils, and some other things that she, uh, she uh, apparently needed, according to their uh, interpretation. So a bundle of these things went on the boat with them. In spite of his frequent samadhi, Ramakrishna noted even the smallest things, so the bundle didn't escape his notice. When he found out that Balaram's family had given these things to Golap Ma, he became very serious. I'm sorry, Gopal Ma and started to talk to Golap Ma, but not Gopal Ma herself, about renunciation. Quote, only one who is endowed with renunciation realizes God. One who is satisfied simply with another devotee's hospitality and leaves empty-handed, that person sits very close to God. During the rest of the boat trip, he kept looking at the bundle, but didn't say a word about it. Gopal Ma was filled with remorse and thought of tossing the bundle into the Ganges. 
As soon as the boat reached Dak Shineswar, Gopalma went anxiously to Holy Mother at the Nahabat. Oh, my child, Gopala, meaning Ramakrishna, is annoyed by seeing this bundle of things. What shall I do? Should I distribute them here instead of taking them home? Recognizing Gopal Ma's distress, Holy Mother, ever compassionate and practical, said, Don't worry, Mother. Let the Master say what he wants. You have no one in the world to help you. Let the Master say it again. You accepted these things because you need them. Still, Gopal Ma took a few things, including a cloth, from the bundle and gave them away. Then she cooked a couple of curries for Ramakrishna and took them to him. Seeing that she was repentant, he smiled and talked to her as usual. Greatly relieved, Gopalma returned to Kamarhati in the afternoon after the master had eaten. When Ramakrishna passed away in August 1886, Gopalma was devastated. She became reclusive and stayed only in her own temple garden but when she began to have visions of Ramakrishna's before, her grief subsided. Quote, once she attended the chariot festival at Mahesh across the Ganges and was overwhelmed with joy as she saw Gopala in all living beings and in everything else. She said that she saw her beloved Gopala in the chariot, in the image of the Lord Jagannath in the chariot, and those who were pulling the chariot, and in the vast crowd. Her beloved Gopala had become manifest in different forms. She was beside herself with joy at this cosmic vision of God and lost outer consciousness of her surroundings in ecstasy. Gopal Ma described this vision to a woman friend saying, I was not myself. I danced and laughed and created quite a commotion. Isn't that a charming childlike thing to say? No embarrassment or remorse just kind of a wry, detached observation about how she had behaved. Whenever she felt a little lonely or despondent, she would visit Ramakrishna's monastic disciples wherever the monastery was located at the time. They would encourage her to cook something, often vegetable curries, and offer them to the master, which pleased her. Due to her ecstasies and continued association with Gopala, Gopal Ma's strict orthodox behavior was gradually removed. Once while Ramakrishna was alive, she even cleaned Vivekananda's place after he'd eaten a bowl of goat meat offered to Mother Kali, which would have been totally unthinkable for the formerly orthodox Gopal Ma. This led to a joyful expression by the master, see how liberal she is becoming day by day? You may have noticed, too, that as we become wiser by holding to principles that matter most, we also become softer by letting go of those that matter least. As William James wrote, the art of being wise is the art of knowing what to overlook. This liberality in Gopal Ma did not mean, however, that she could ever encompass anything that would keep her mind from being totally God-centered, her core principle. Swami Ramakrishnananda narrated this well-known mosquito curtain incident. Quote, One day after Ramakrishna had passed away, some of his disciples went to see her and found a room full of mosquitoes and other troublesome creatures. Although she did not appear to mind them and kept on repeating the name of the Lord, it distressed them to see her in such discomfort. So the next day, one of the disciples brought her a mosquito curtain. That night when she sat down to repeat the name, she found her mind constantly wandering to the curtain, thinking whether a cockroach or a rat might not be eating off a corner of it. Seeing this, she said, what, this wretched curtain thus to take my mind away from my Gopala? And without ado, she made it up into a bundle and sat down again to her devotions with the mosquitoes all about her. The next morning, we were just getting up at the mat when Gopal Ma appeared. She had walked all the way several miles, and must have started at 3 a.m. She laid the bundle down. What is it? Someone asked. It is the curtain you gave me yesterday. It takes my mind away from God. I don't want it, was her answer, and nothing could persuade her to take it back. We mentioned that if Gopal Ma needed to learn anything, 
Gopala would immediately appear to teach her. But this wasn't the only way that he came to her aid. One day in 1887, Gopal Ma came to Balaram's house in Calcutta. A number of devotees were also there, and they were aware of her high spiritual experiences, so they began to ask her some questions. She said to them, look, I am an old, illiterate woman. What do I know about the scriptures? Why don't you ask Sharat, Yogin, and Tarak, who were monastic disciples of Ramakrishna? But they persisted, so finally she said, well, let me ask Gopala. Oh, Gopala, I don't understand what they are talking about. Why don't you answer their questions? Hello, Gopala says this. In this way, Gopal Ma answered the devotees' abstruse questions. They were amazed. That remarkable question and answer session ended abruptly, however, when Gopal Ma suddenly said, Oh, Gopala, why are you going away? Will you not answer their questions anymore? But Gopala had left. After Vivekananda's return to India from the West in 1897, he sent three of his Western disciples, Sarah Bull, Josephine McLeod, and Sister Nivedita, to visit Gopal Ma at Kamarhati. We previously read Nivedita's description of Gopal Ma's room after this visit. These three women were all highly pleased with Gopal Ma's conversation and hospitality. Quote, on that day, Gopal Ma saw her Gopala in them and affectionately kissed them, touching their chins. She cordially asked them to sit on her bed and serve them puffed rice, sweet coconut balls, and whatever else she had in her room. She narrated some of her visions to them when asked, and they were overwhelmed. They enjoyed her simple refreshments and asked her for some puffed rice to take back to America. Once two women devotees came to Vivekananda at Balaram's house requesting initiation, but he sent them to Gopal Ma. She was reluctant, however, and said to Swamiji, my son, what do I know about initiation? I'm a poor widow. Swamiji replied with a smile, are you an ordinary person? You have attained perfection through japa. If you cannot give initiation, then who can? Let me tell you, why don't you give your own ishta mantra to them? It will serve their purpose. Moreover, what will you do with your mantra anymore? So Gopal Ma initiated the women, but she was unwilling to accept any gift or offering for them, which is the convention. When she was persuaded, she followed the custom and accepted two rupees from them so that the disciples might not be hurt. She had no greed or desire for worldly objects. Her simple instruction to them was, listen, offer your body and mind to God. Initiation is not an in insignificant thing. Do not leave your seat without repeating 10,000 japa in each sitting. While practicing spiritual disciplines, Disconnect yourself from thoughts of the world. Start your japa at three in the morning so that nobody is aware of it, and again practice in the evening. In 1903, Gopalma became very ill, so Swami Brahmananda sent one of his disciples to nurse her. Quote, the boy brought fruits and vegetables for her and slept in a corner of her room. He awoke very early in the morning, however, when he heard Gopal Ma talking with someone. Wait, wait, even the birds have not yet sung. Let the morning come, my sweet darling, and then I shall take you for a bath in the Ganges. Later, the young disciple said, no one else lives in your room. With whom were you talking this morning? Don't you know that Gopala lives with me? I was trying to control his naughtiness, she replied. As her health continued to decline and she could no longer live alone, in 1904, disciples of Ramakrishna arranged for her to be brought to Balaram Bosha's house in Bagbazar, where she had been with Ramakrishna. When Sister Nivedita heard about her condition, she was eager to bring Gopalma to her own Bagbazar home. The following description comes from the dedicated a biography of Nivedita. Quote, in December, Nivedita had opened her house to Gopalarma, the aged Brahmin widow who had been the first to introduce her to Bagbazar. Worn out, ill, 
Almost in her second childhood, the old lady had no one left in the world to look after her. Now Nivedita, who loved and worshipped her, gave her one of the small independent rooms that opened on the courtyard of her house. Gopalarma had a disciple, Kusum, who attended to her physical needs, cooking her food, bringing her water from the Ganges, cleaning out her room. In her turn, she provided Nivedita with that radiant maternal affection before which Ramakrishna had opened his heart and gave her back the sense of solitude which her active life had lost. Every morning, Nivedita would go and sit on her doorstep, waiting until the old lady beckoned her in. Gopalarma would be chanting her prayers. When she saw Nivedita, her wrinkled face would crease into a smile of joy, then her eyes would sparkle. She mentioned her then to come forward, and she always placed a choice bit of fruit in her mouth. She massaged her aged friend when she was in pain, and she took care of her like a delicate child in whom the Divine Mother was hiding in order to be revered in weakness. For Nivedita too, Gopalarma was something of her own mother to whom she could render no service. I feel thrilled, she wrote in a letter at this time, when I'm with Gopalarma. The words of St. Elizabeth sound in my ears. What is this to me that the mother of my Lord should visit me? For I believe that in Gopalar Ma, his sainthood is great as that of a Paramahamsa, a soul fully free. I feel that if I can only worship her enough, blessings will descend on all whom I love through her. Could more be said? Gopal Ma received this loving care in Nivedita's house for two years. A nearby Brahmin family prepared her food, and in the evening they would bring a few luchis, fried bread, and other food to her room. Though her body was deteriorating, her mind was ever absorbed in her beloved Gopala, which she saw everywhere. She had a pet cat in which she also saw Gopala. One day it was lying peacefully on Nivedita's lap when Kusum came and pushed it away. Immediately, Gopal, uh, Gopal Ma cried out, What have you done? What have you done? Gopala is going away. He is gone. Once earlier, when the Holy Mother went to see her, Gopal Ma sighed, Gopala, you have come. Look, you have sat on my lap all these days. Now you take me on your lap. And the Holy Mother took Gopal Ma's head on her lap and caressed her affectionately. When her last days arrived, Gopal Ma was taken to a room on the bank of the Ganges in a bed which Nivedita had beautifully decorated with flowers, sandal paste, and garlands. For two days, Nivedita and others faithfully waited beside her on the bank of the Ganges. On the second night, Sometime after the tide had begun coming in, they sensed the end was near and carried her down the few steps to the river where she could lie with her feet touching the sacred waters. There, one of the monks she'd known as boys bent over her and whispered into her ear auspicious words for the last hour. Om Ganga Narayana, Om Ganga Narayana Brahma. Nivedita wrote, then one at the head of the bier looking up at the brightening of the sky behind the clouds, asked, Is this the dawn? And from the foot came back the answer, Yes, it is the dawn. And then, looking down, we saw that the waters that had bathed the feet of the dying were already receding, were already sunken some inches below us. Gopama had died, indeed at the moment of dawn, on the very turn of the outgoing tide. Once, when a devotee asked for some advice, Gopal Ma said, ask advice from Gopala. He is within you. No one can give better advice than he. This is the truth. Cry with a longing heart and you will reach him. May we all be inspired by the devotion and personal relationship with Gopala Gopala, so profoundly demonstrated by Gopal Ma. May we all come to know that the same God is within each and every one of us. That is my prayer for all of us today.
Thou alone art my father, thou alone art my mother, thou alone art my friend, thou alone art my companion, thou alone art my wisdom, thou alone art my strength, thou alone art my all in all, O God of gods. Peace, peace, peace be unto all.